It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live uh, Wednesdays at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about visual, visual storytelling, making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, uh, designing characters, developing worlds, uh, creating things with themes, all the stuff that goes around this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. And there's a whole pile of He-Man <laughs> stuff in the studio today because I'm joined by Kevin Coppa returning to the show. Yes. Good to see you again, Hello, Kevin. Hello, thank you. Very excited to be here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know if you're as excited as I am. <laughs> because Kevin brought this big pile of He-Man figures from the... This is from the, the, the classics line. Yes, Mattel Masters of the Universe classics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those... Well, I should warn everybody, we're going to talk a lot about He-Man today. <laughs> and that should come as no surprise to anybody who's ever listened to the show. They know I love the, the character and the world. But uh, the big topic today is going to be... Uh, the hero who refuses to fight and how that changes the story, what the stories tend to, uh, what, 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 what characteristics those kinds of stories have, who they're for, and uh, do we, is, you know, uh, debating the validity of a hero who, you know, uh, chooses pacifism mm -hmm. over, uh, you know, violence. Right. Um, but He-Man's going to figure in largely into this. <laughs> uh, but but uh, before we get into talking about He-Man... Sure. You just got back. You yes. just got back mm -hmm. to Michigan from Gallifrey One. Yes. And we should also say that uh, you are a, a ringer <laughs> for <laughs> the 10th Doctor. Uh, and you appeared at the, um, uh, the, the Kids Read Comics event yes, this past right. year. Mm -hmm. Uh, you participated in the Kids Comics Revolution Awards, which was an award show hosted by me and Dave Roman, put together by me and Dave Roman and Chris Duffy. And we've got some video, Matt, I think, of, uh, of Kevin's appearance in the award show where uh, he, he saved the day because <laughs> the awards are given out to all the different yeah. uh, artists who won. And then uh, Vordak, the incomprehensible, Ooh. kept stealing the awards and running away with them. Uh, and thankfully, you were there to help. You were there as a couple different characters, but right. the, 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 the climax was at the end, right? Matt, Definitely. can we roll that? And the winner is of the favorite cartoonist, Jeff, Jeff Kinney. Kinney. <laughs> <laughs> what? Who's the plate? Who? Hold it right there, Bordak. Who are you? I'm the doctor. <laughs> oh, the doctor is in the house. Doctor who? <laughs> oh, I've never heard that before. Uh. <laughs> the TARDIS alerted me to a post on the message board about some villainy being done here. Yeah? What's this about award snatchery I keep hearing? It's just a hobby. Oh. <laughs> wait, no, wait a minute. No, it isn't. Should never be a hobby, and we're going to fix this problem now. What the heck is that? It's a sort of screwdriver. Looks like something serious. <laughs> You've never wanted to own a sonic screwdriver? What does it do? It sonics things like a screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> So, if, if for those who are listening in the audio version, you can find this by just searching, uh, well, you can go to kidscomicsrevolution.com, for one. That takes you to the podcast that Dave Roman and I do together. Uh, and in the feed is, is a link to that video. It's also on the Kids Comics Revolution uh, YouTube page. You can watch the whole ceremony. It's, it was a lot of fun. But uh, thank you, Kevin, for doing all that you did for that Oh, you're event. welcome. It was fun. Yeah, you showed up as uh, <laughs> Puppet Aang yeah. and Puppet Naruto. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that leads me to the next thing that I got, you sure. know, credit that I got to give is that you are the guy behind the puppet benders. Yes, You've been on the show to talk yes, about that before, and this is the first time I've been on the show where it's actually legit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what do you, oh, what, oh, that's right. Yeah, the, let's the, talk about the that. The Legend of Korra DVD and Blu-ray has a special feature on it that features, of course, the Korra puppet benders. That is so awesome. <laughs> now, okay, I just want to frame this up with the fact that. Here's this guy, Kevin Cope, who comes along. Like, I love Avatar: Last Airbender, which is going to figure into our conversation today, by the way. Um, and I want to make puppets. I want to make little fan videos about the thing. The videos got the attention of the creators of the show. Yes. And then you guys started kind of working together a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now it's an official part 
of the DVD release. That's so cool. That's it's, not what you set out to do, though. You just no, do it no, for fun. No, no, just for fun. And, and they, it just it caught on, and they loved it, and uh, they pushed for having it as part of the special features on there. And they contacted me, and we were able to do it. It's been a lot of fun. And I have to just say that really the thing that blows me away about, I don't know if it's just the Internet age or, or the age of creators mixing and mingling with fans, mm -hmm. uh, it's just been extraordinary to be able to know the people who've been involved with the show and to meet them and to see what how extraordinarily caring they are about the fans. I gotta tell you, I've been in the hospital this past summer mm -hmm. for a number of uh, surgeries and things that have come along. Uh, without getting into detail of that, I have to say that we were kind of in the middle of making future videos for them, for uh, the DVDs uh, upcoming and a couple other uh, venues. And I've had to put that on pause, of course, because of health issues. And during all this, the folks who I, who I'm working with, as long as Mike and Brian and all the folks involved with the show, they sent me an art book and a bunch of goodies and a bunch of you know swag and they all autographed and did pictures in it said get well and it was just it was really blew me away just that how awesome. how really caring and how nice they are i'm glad that you brought this up uh not the fact that you were in the hospital well, no. i'm sorry that you're yeah. in the hospital <laughs> so, so. <laughs> but i'm glad you brought up this this yes. idea of the fans and the creators commingling Absolutely. and everybody participation because mm -hmm. i just watched last night there was a, a frontline special about uh generation like is what it was called and mm -hmm. it was this uh, investigation about this idea about in the, the the you know the millennials and how corporations are manipulating them into liking Coca Cola and Reebok and everything, uh -huh. getting mobilizing the fans of products and and entertainment things to become the marketing for the thing, right? Yeah. So like taking word of mouth, what the way we did it when we were kids, where it's like I'm wearing the T-shirt, I tell my friends, hey, you haven't heard of you mm -hmm. know uh, the dead milkman? What's wrong with you? Right. Um, but like taking it into like this broader uh, sphere and. Part of their reasoning was is that there's this implication that the fans are now in on it. They are participating with the creators. They can talk with the creators. Yes. And they're kind of they painted it in this very this light of the corporations are manipulating our children. Uh, <laughs> and and that's one side of it. Sure, sure. But you're pointing out the other side that I think is really interesting. There is. I mean, there's always going to be have to be a certain separation creativity, you know, between a creator and a, and a fan. But mm -hmm. th there's also this amazing connective tissue that's happening that's actually personally I think endearing creators to fans and fans to creators more than ever. There used to never be that communication before. They never got to see the fruits of their labor and I think mm -hmm. that helps fire and fuel their creativity even further. Yeah, I, I, I remember actually going to a BotCon back in 1997, met Peter Cullen for the first time, the voice of Optimus Prime, for those who don't know, and somebody asked him, like, what was it like getting all the fan mail and blah, 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 you know, what was it like when it was really big, when it yeah. was when Death of Optimus Prime and everything? And he's like, I got one letter. <laughs> like, I had no idea anybody liked the oh, character geez. or was enjoying it. He's like, now I know, but, mm -hmm. but back then it's like it was just a job because we had no interaction with yeah. them, and now they do. You look at guys like mm -hmm. Rob Paulson, Yakko Panky on Twitter, the guy who plays yeah. uh, one of the Ninja Turtles uh, and Animaniacs and everything, and like he is always conversing with his fans now. So, yeah, uh, I, yeah I think that the, yeah, there's pros and cons, right? Sure, I'm, I'm glad that you point out the positive mm -hmm. with that. So, okay, the Papa Benders are at YouTube.com/slash yes. Corner Sphere, correct? K O R N E R yes. Sphere. And I don't know if we'll be making too many more YouTube videos because now we're you know with contract <laughs> with Nick, and that's <laughs> it's it's their thing now. So we'll be doing yeah. it with them. And but I sold out. No. <laughs> I'm happy to because it's a lot more fun and a lot more people get to see it now. So. Yeah, yeah, that that is cool. So you yeah. could get the Cora DVD to see some of the Correct. new mm -hmm. Pop Bender videos, um, and then okay, and then we can go back to talking about Gallifrey One. So you just got yes, back from Gallifrey, right, Gallifrey One. One, the Doctor Who convention. What do you do at a Doctor Who convention? Oh boy, what don't we do? Actually, this year I took it very easy. In years past, we've been very involved in doing panels. Uh, I do a prop making panel. We've done mm -hmm. a, a costuming as the Doctor panel. We've done all sorts of things like that where we get to talk to people about. Uh, accuracy and, and finding the right fabrics and dressing up and all those sorts of things. And I've done a, a monster panel in the past. And actually, you're seeing a picture right now. Oh, I, is that up? Uh, that's up. Yeah. Oh, I love there this. There we go. This is the, uh, the Candyman <laughs> as a monster from classic Doctor Who that I've always wanted to dress up as. And because I've, I was sick this past year, as I mentioned before, I didn't get to make anything new for this convention. I was like, well, I'm just going to go. I'm going to dress up like Doctor Who, and that will be just that. Well, all the friends that I've made out there, there's a, a prop maker and his wife, by uh, name of Malachi and Christine Keller, uh -huh. and they were just so nice. They went and they made this Candyman costume without me knowing and surprised me when I got there and uh, told me, would you wear this for the masquerade? That is so cool. And I was just so honored, and it was just so so much fun. And we went up on stage, and I could barely see out of this thing, and I was sweating like crazy, but I loved <laughs> every second of it. And that's a classic Cyberman, too, yeah, right? I think, I think there's a backstage photo of me where you can see... Uh, 
Oh, it's you with the helmet with, off. With the helmet off, and uh, <laughs> I look kind of miserable, but my gosh, I'm actually just conserving energy because I'm having so much fun, and I'm, there we are. <laughs> oh, can we see that, I, Matt? I, there I, we are. Like I said, I look miserable, but no, I'm actually just, like I said, conserving energy before I put it all on stage and we, we goof around. Wow. But, so, okay. So, so <laughs> what, I, I take you had a good time. Oh, I had a great time. It's yeah. absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and Rachel... Uh, who was your your uh, companion, <laughs> as it were, <laughs> at the show? Uh, how? I guess I was watching the feed, and I I, I lost track of how many costume changes she went through oh at gosh. this event. She she had at least five on one day, Saturday, and uh, she was tired at the end of that weekend. I'll that's bet. For sure. Absolutely. I'll bet. But everything she did was just fantastic, and we both had a lot of fun. Oh, that is so cool. So okay, uh, so so you do a lot of the kind of stuff that you've done for Kids Read Comics in the past, yeah. where you led a workshop on how to do special effects. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, cosplay workshop that would be kind of neat to bring to Kids Read yeah, Comics. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, that would be a lot mm -hmm. of fun. You think Rachel would be up for it? I, if we can get her out here, because she, she lives <laughs> in San Diego right now. She's doing yeah. her college and her school. If we can get her out here, I, I'd love. She'd love to do that. Rachel, sure. if you're watching, that's right. June 21, 20, or yeah, 21 and twenty two. <laughs> um, Okay, so yes. we we've have I missed anything? Established? Oh, also you were we're going to talk about PowerCon too. Yes. You went to that. Yes, absolutely. PowerCon is the uh, He-Man, Thundercats, and now Ninja Turtles convention. Oh, wow! So they've combined all these great uh, '80s, '90s shows all together. But it's it's prim at the moment it's still primarily He-Man. Uh, last year was very ninja, heavy Ninja Turtles based, but it's taking place in Torrance, uh, California. Mm -hmm. uh, this next coming year, it's going to be in New York, in Queens. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so in and September. I, I was just blown away by how fantastic this is because it's everything I've ever dreamed of doing in terms of meeting the people who've created these toy lines and the animation, the animated shows. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing to sit on these panels and hear the stories they had to tell. And it's great for them because, again, we talked about getting to see the fruits of your labor. Yeah. These are guys who haven't seen that, like Transformers, until, you know, 20, 30 years later. Right. Oh, you know? was was the one that you were at? Was that the one where Alan Oppenheimer and then the dude played Skeletor yes. in the Mike Young series uh -huh. did the little skit together? They did. Oh my gosh. They did. <laughs> it's it's so cr incredible. It's so incredible to see these guys come up here and <laughs> get their voices on the middle of the floor. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's what I want the afterlife to be like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but okay, so you you and Rachel went to this too, and mm -hmm. Rachel had this amazing Tegla costume and a yes. Shira costume. And a Shira costume. Yes. Can we look at the Shira picture of, of you as Swiftwind? Uh, Oh, I was talking about the horse one, Matt. Let's see. Uh, oh, there we go. There we go. This this was a, a, a little ditty we did for um, a promo for the next PowerCon convention. Uh, she and I were promoting it, and I was I had the swift wind. She wanted to be She-Ra, and I decided, well, I, I can't obviously cosplay any of these gigantically buff men. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a twig boy. So I said, well, uh, there's these dumb horse masks out there. I could convert that into a swift wind. So I, I got that, and I, I puppeteered that. And that is awesome. There we were, and I cried crystal tears of power. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a pretty good swift win, actually. Yes. <laughs> you almost you almost sound like uh, <laughs> uh, uh, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on his name? Oh, I know he did like five voices in the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, anyway, anyway. <laughs> uh, so so PowerCon is this September, yes. and you told me about mm -hmm. it at this last year's Absolutely. Kids Read Comics. Absolutely, and this and just fantastic costumes and fantastic cosplays, and it's still one of those conventions that's small in its beginnings, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a it's a great atmosphere. It's a great small friendly community atmosphere well i think there's there's something in the air about creating events with more tighter focus right as more yes. and more people talk about things like comic-con san diego being so big that you can't right. even there's no way in one like in a five-day period you can enjoy exactly. everything there mm -hmm. um and and yet there was a <laughs> speaking of documentaries again there was that brony con documentary yeah. that i watched right. where it really focused on like mm -hmm. the community aspect and yeah. the, the 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 small laser beam focus of right. this thing um so that's cool. It is. I, oh, I'd, I'd be remiss if we didn't show the Tila costume for Rachel. Yeah, we do need that. to show Rachel's Tila costume. Oh, that was incredible. It's just because it's so fun. Here it is. Here we go. Here we are with an incredible Skeletor and Shira that were on uh, site taking photos with everybody, <laughs> and uh, she made she made that completely herself out of Warbler, which is the all new cosplay uh, material that everyone's making their armors and things out of. Ah. And she met all sorts of folks. You know, there was a, a He Man character guy walking around. And it's rare that you see an actual giant muscled guy walking around as He Man. There he is. Okay, yeah, because I was going to say <laughs> He Man is a tough character to cosplay. He is, unless you've got some sort of big padded suit. And yeah. we also got to meet uh, the He-Man and She-Ra from the Power Tour. I don't know if anybody remembers that. There was an actual live action tour. There we go. This is He-Man and She-Ra. They are a married couple. Wow. And uh, they were just the 
best people. Yeah. The kindest, nicest people. <laughs> Rachel looks happy. <laughs> they actually helped Rachel out. There was a guy kind of following her around, and they told her they told him to get lost. So she was saved by He Man at this convention. Oh my God! Exactly. <laughs> and it was, it was great. They carried their, they brought their swords with them, and they crossed the swords for pictures, and they were just. Really, really fun people. Oh, so cool. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to look at going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, you got to go. I, I, this it sounds year? like I do. I mean, if I've, I've gone to BotCon, why haven't I been to oh, PowerCon yet? You'd yeah. love this. Uh, okay, so mm-hmm. now we can talk about our topic, yes. uh, the hero who refuses to fight, which I'll uh, get to when I talk about He-Man, mm-hmm. all these figures here. And <laughs> uh, I think... I might be in the presence of somebody who loves He-Man maybe even more than I do. Uh, because even before we started recording, you were like, give me all this trivia about you know what they're doing with the series next, where, mm-hmm. what that refers to, what the, the new mini-comics are talking about, yeah. what the new story arcs and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, have you always been a huge Masters of the Universe fan? Or is this a fairly recent, like in the last... You you know, know, well, I was born in 80. Uh, uh, the series came out in, uh, I want to say, 81 or 82. Yeah, thereabouts. And so I was very young by the time it was getting started. And I kind of I kind of popped in around 85. Okay. That's when the Horde appeared. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, the Horde. I was just, I was a Horde guy. That's, yeah. That was my faction. <laughs> and uh, I had all of them, and I had a few of the figures. And funny thing is, is you know, there's always a little bit of controversy around the, the, the cartoon series. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because people are saying, oh, it's this, it's violent, it's barbarian, and whatnot. And, and, I, th- and then there's other people who are disappointed because then when they watch it, it's not it's it's violent, not, barbarian. not at all. But <laughs> as a kid, I just absolutely loved it. And then, of course, you know, it goes out of fashion, and new things come in, Ninja Turtles came in. And you yeah. go, as, as, a, as a kid, your, ship, your, your focus shifts. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I came back to it uh, a while ago, and I actually... Through the internet and through all these things becoming available, the old mini comics that I never got to collect as a kid mm-hmm. are up online in scans and getting to read them. I realized what a really cool origin story this is in terms of toy making and in terms of uh, idea, you know, generating uh, from a company in terms yeah. of something to sell to kids. And and the original stories are so different from what Filmation came up with, which is so different from what all these other companies came up with. And there's so many different ideas that came together to form this one really awesome property yeah yeah they they started to cross pollinate after a while yeah. right because mm-hmm. you'd start to see oh and well, now suddenly orko's in the storybooks right where he wasn't originally mm-hmm. and then later on gwildor starts appearing in some of the yeah. media after the the motion picture comes out and mm-hmm. so like you can see these things kind of informing one another but okay but when you say this one big awesome story what is it about it for you particularly because i've talked ad nauseum about sure. what, what it is for me but what is it for you about this 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 because i mean there's a lot of different sorts of stories there's dungeons and dragons right. there's mm-hmm. other fantasy stories there's yeah. legend with tom cruise what what about this one in particular that grips you? You know, that's one of those things that you're like, it's hard to put your thumb on, but I have to kind of go back to what uh, the folks who made the property have said, mm-hmm. which is that it's basically everything rolled into one. It's, it's everything and anything. You have, you know, the sword and sorcery, which was hot and big back then, which is still, I think, a very popular genre. Yeah. You've got science fiction. You've got space-type characters. You've got monsters, universal-type monsters, you know, yeah. uh, based on there. I mean, you've got all these things wrapped up into one. I mean, you've even got a guy who's a cowboy, for Pete's sake, with lasers, <laughs> that, right. lasers that come out of his legs. Rio you know? Blast? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's... it's And it's somehow, it's bizarre, it's weird. you got an elephant that shoots water out of his robotic nose, and yet it works. Yeah. Because there's something for every kid that everything that he would find cool or neat. Well, just yesterday, I, I teach an ongoing comics class here mm-hmm. in Ann Arbor, and I just taught a, a, a recurring thing I do in my classes is we have a session where we watch a He-Man episode, uh-huh. and the kids have to redesign one. Uh, they have to redesign three of the characters. Oh, I cool. say, watch the show, look for three characters that you could do something cooler with. Mm-hmm. It's just a character design exercise, sure. but I take advantage of the fact that it's my class, so I get to watch an episode of He-Man with Sweet. kids and listen to them <laughs> react to it. You know, um, and. I, you see things like characters named Merman, uh-huh. and you see Beast Man and Stinkor, and a, a 10-year-old doesn't even question it. It's not, right. And it's not because they're dumb. It's just that they, they're just buying into the fantasy, and what, he's a merman. Why not call him merman? There's yeah. no, the, mm-hmm. none of this. And then I show it to teens. I've tried doing that with some of my teen classes. Yeah. It does not work. Really? Yeah, the teens are very like, merman, what kind of name is that, right? Uh, but Johnny like, Two Cools, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really what it is. Uh, but, 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 uh, and yeah, so there's something about, like, it, what I love about it is it has this, this kind of grandiose kid logic. Yeah. Like, Snout mm-hmm. Spout is ridiculous. Yes. But that's the kind of stuff you're drawing when you're a little kid. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and going, for me, like, people ask me all the time, like, what's so great about it? What's so great about why you talk about it all the time? I tried getting into it. The animation was kind of crummy. I watched mm-hmm. the uh, Filmation one, and I was screaming, well, please, somebody on screen, move. <laughs> Quit looking up Man in Arms' nose. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, you'll see it if you watch this. There's a lot of upshots. Um, 
And the thing that I come back to again and again, and this this gripped me when I was a mm -hmm. child, but I didn't know the words for it. But uh, it, it was all the stuff you said. Plus, He Man is a hero who chooses to use his power not yes. to fight, but to help everybody, yes. good and bad. You know, uh, there's countless episodes where He Man, you risked everything to save Merman. Every life, even an evil one, is worth That's saving. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and, and you didn't see that on anything else, you know? I mean, no, like, there was right. broadcast standards and practices uh, preventing showing, like, certain things like child endangerment. Right. You couldn't show alcohol use or anything like that. But you never, like, all the heroes punched each other, punched right. bad guys. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, there was, there was gunplay in sure. later shows. Uh, Mutant Ninja Turtles, a lot of whacking with sticks exactly. and swords exactly. and things. Uh, but you had a very altruistic hero being presented yeah. and that and that was the missive in fact it's funny they even said in the the when they were making the the feature film the original demand was that he man couldn't hit anybody with the sword he couldn't punch anybody he couldn't do anything really they, they had and, that oh. and the director was like how am i supposed to make a movie that appeals to more than just you know four year olds that right you know where the lead hero character can't even punch anybody <laughs> and eventually they relaxed on that but okay. that was that was the original yeah, tall order. To, but uh, Mm -hmm. All things considered, it was a pretty mild action yes. movie yes. by comparison mm -hmm. to, you know, things like definitely. Commando. Oh, definitely. <laughs> right, yeah. No, there wasn't any blood or gore in it. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, and all, mm -hmm. all of that. I mean, even, like, when and somebody gets wounded, it's still, like, tastefully done. Of and, course, and he was still very, a very selfless hero in terms of yeah. helping everybody. Yeah, even though it was Dolph Lundgren. Yeah, by right. the way, uh, Dolph Lundgren, <laughs> He-Man, uh, where, where do you st stand on that? On that, you know, I think he makes a better King Grayskull than he does. Yeah. Him. I think if they were to dress him up now like that, that would that would be his role. But uh, Frank Langella as Skeletor, an excellent performer behind it. I'm not so certain about the mask. Yeah, I, I feel like they could have done a real skull and, and still had his performance. Nowadays, of course, back then they didn't have the option of CG or anything. They they wanted right. the actor to be there. You know, if you're going to get Frank Langella, you want to see something of Frank Langella. That's true. Behind a rubber mask. That yeah. Nowadays that's, that's they the put thing. those 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 balls those dots on there and they yeah. just CG them. But yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so for the time that he that it was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so so yeah, this this idea of the the hero who chooses not to fight, mm -hmm. and what I love about this as a creator now, what I love about it is it presents you with like as you pointed out, it presents a serious challenge in yes. storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, how do you show exciting action when you can't show a guy hitting another right. guy? Uh, and in the filmation show, granted, the animation was a little bit restrained is that sure. a way to put it sure mm -hmm. but what i love about it is that they always found ways where it's like okay he'll 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 cut a rock with the sword right. but you'll never see him cut a living thing right he'll pick a guy up and he'll throw him mm -hmm. but he'll never punch him right so there's right. still action in there uh exactly. but but like when i watched the 2002 remake with mike <laughs> young i'm the first thing that hit me was like i just he man hit a guy i don't know how i feel about that <laughs> <laughs> and like there's a, a, an iPad game that came out recently yes. yeah mm -hmm. and John Green actually showed it to me he's like hey George you gotta see this and I started playing it next to him and like the first thing I said I was like oh you have to hit the bats <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but there's there's this this marvelous like the technical problem that you have to solve with mm -hmm. that. But yeah. other stories have done that. They have, and I think some of the best filmation stories were where people tried to tackle that issue, mm -hmm. and in that they were able to explore, I think, for children, the concept behind having power because they always said that the reason they called it you know Masters of the Universe, and the always reason that Mattel came up with the idea of I have the power being the catchphrase, mm -hmm. is they were doing play testing uh, with kids with a couple various different genres of toys, and they found that kids really latched onto the idea of power. Mm. Because, you know, as when you're a little kid, you, uh, you know, your mother is always in charge telling you what to do, right? That's right. Your dad's always telling you what to do. And the kids love, seem to latch onto this idea of having the most powerful man in the universe in their control. Ah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And they found that that play avenue is what led them to kind of, you know, latch onto this idea, and it, of course, obviously exploded as a huge success. But I like it that the cartoon explored the idea of when you have such great power, it can also be a very fragile thing. And how you talk about the problem with power episode. That's exactly that power. Oh that, my that gosh, issue. I fall apart whenever I watch exactly. that episode. Uh -huh. There's a couple episodes that follow that, but problem with power is probably one of the best ones. And you asked me to define my top five favorite episodes. Okay, right? okay, that, let's go there. I would be remiss if, if, if because that's on one of them, absolutely. And the problem with power, uh, Skeletor manipulates He-Man into thinking he killed someone inadvertently. And mm -hmm. the whole episode deals with his fallout on that. Like, oh my gosh. The what, first know? thing he does yes. when Skeletor, as the in disguise, says, you mm -hmm. killed my brother. And yeah. oh gosh, Alan Oppenheimer, so good. Oh, yeah. The way he's like, "You killed him! You killed my brother!" The first thing He Man does, like, I quit. Yeah, I don't deserve to be He Man anymore. Yeah, 
Uh, not necessarily the most responsible reaction. <laughs> no, no, but but it parallels a lot of what kids would go through. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I yeah. and I really admired that. And it, and and of course, he eventually comes back to accepting who he is and what he has to do. And then he finds out he was tricked too, as well. But right. he goes through all those stages. I feel like the, a kid, a child, would go through in yeah. first discovering that I have the ability to cause harm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 what do I do? I run away. Right. I'm going back to the castle. And then this is, and by the way, trivia note: this is the mm -hmm. only time we ever see him turn off. He Man. Yes. You know, where yeah. he's that's one of, the, one of the few episodes where you get new animation rather than the recycled <laughs> cells over and over again. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. And then he throws, like, just like a kid, hide the thing that did the thing, yes. right? right? Like, throw the, the, the sword down the pit. Right. So nobody will ever find it, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. That, that I, I love that idea of uh, dealing with the power, uh, finding out the responsible way to use the power right. and, and the, through the consequences. What other one does that? Uh, in my opinion, the dragon's gift. Ah, yeah. Which, Another great one. Exactly. If you remember the, the giant dragon, Granomir, mm -hmm. uh, Skeletor ends up freezing Man-at-Arms into stone, and he goes to He-Man and Tila, they go to Granomir to find out what can we do about this, and he tells He-Man, well, you got to go into the forest and you got to chop down this, this ancient living tree before I help you with, man, with this Well, problem. what Granomir never says that okay, it's a yeah, living yeah. tree. Well, he says, what? I mean, we, we assume it's living, but we don't know I'm it's sentient. Ahead. Right, yeah. but yeah, he doesn't cut down this tree. So he goes and finds this tree, and he discovers... That it has you. a face on it. It has yeah. a face on it, that it has a life. And, and in the end, the tree is even willing to give up its life to help him, even though he's lived this long. He-Man makes the decision that I can't do this. I can't take a life to save another. No yeah. matter what. Yeah. And he goes back to the, you know, Granomir the Dragon and tells him that. And he says, well, you actually, this is the test that I gave you. And you, you did the right thing. You did and, the right thing. And, and it, what's, what's also nice is they wrote in these really great, I, that was a Larry to tell you episode, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so. Yeah, and he wrote some of the best ones. Um, but there's, there's a line in there where, he, you know, Man at Arms is kind of like the father figure yeah. in the story. He's mm -hmm. Tila's adoptive father, but also he's got the great '80s mustache, and he <laughs> and he he acts as advisor to Adam all the time. Yes. Uh, and when He Man says Tila, we can't do this, and Tila's like, "But my father." He's like, "If he were here, right. he would agree with us." Mm -hmm. So not only does he make the choice for himself, but he says, "And after all, mom and dad." would probably not do this too, right? right. So there's like, mm -hmm. there's baked into this thing too, a lot, and a lot of the shows is this this sense of respect for the elders yes. too. But not, you know, another thing, I want to go off on a tangent real sure, quick, because sure. one other thing I love about this is there's, um, did you read that Mark Evanier article recently about Dungeons and Dragons and no, writing no, it? No, I didn't miss that. I missed uh, I'll have to dig it up for the show okay. notes. Uh, actually, I believe it was Zach Giolongo who pointed me at it. And it was a rather troubling article about how, you're familiar with the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon show from the yes. 80s? Mm -hmm. Um, and there was this character, I think it was Eric. Eric okay. was the shield bearer, the, mm -hmm. the cavalier. And okay. he's played by Donnie Most from Happy Days. <laughs> uh, and he's always like the, the sourpuss. Like everybody else is like, oh, we're going on an adventure. And he's like, oh, this is going to suck. And then like he trips and falls in the mud and everybody points and laughs at him. So he's like, he's like the stinker of the group, sure. which is fun to watch. But um, one of the things that uh, the people behind the show, like the producers, I forget who, but they imp impressed it upon Mark Evanier as he was writing these episodes that Eric always has to be wrong because by not going along with the team, we have to show that that's a mistake. Hmm. And we're trying to show teamwork and cooperation, which is great. That's something you're trying to teach kids. Mm -hmm. But also there's a danger there in that you could also be saying, like, if you stand out and you're <laughs> different, you know, and as, a, as weird kids growing up, we yeah. can be impressionable about that. I think if, if you stand out too much, you, you know, you're wrong. You really yeah. should be like the other kids. Hmm. Um, one of the things I love about the He-Man, especially the Filmation show, is they were very careful to not take too strong a stance on any particular issue. Uh, when I think of um, the Double-Edged Sword episode, you know the one I'm talking about with Chad and his grandpa, and they find a piece of Eternium in the desert. His grandpa's in a wheelchair. Yes, okay. Yes. And he doesn't like to fight because when he fought as a young man, his actions inadvertently caused the death of some of his fellow soldiers. Right. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they say it in the episode. It's like some people never got out of that pile of rubble at all. Yeah. You know? Uh, and in the end, He-Man says, like, you know, uh, make-believe is fun, and there's nothing wrong with imagining great adventures, but just remember, when it's the real thing, someone could get hurt. Right. He doesn't say don't fight. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say fighting is, 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 uh, is always wrong. Right. He just says that mm -hmm. when it happens, there's consequences to That's that. That's right. And I love how well they walk yeah. that line. Uh-huh. Uh, where they, they, they taught, but they didn't preach. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Absolutely makes sense. And... Uh, like I said, I, I was kind of amazed because you forget about it when you're a kid. Obviously, you watched it way back when. And I, I recently got, of course, 
Uh, I say recently, this was already like a year ago or more, but the, the big box set with all the episodes and I, I sat there and I watched them. I'm like, oh my gosh, this, you know, there's some episodes that are really cheesy where they've got a clown character. They go to the circus oh, and it's like, Quackers the Clown. Crackers and, the Clown, and yeah. And Skeletor gets <laughs> zipped out of the big top on a rocket and there's... I want to be in the circus too, you know? <laughs> That's yeah, there's, terrible. There's always those episodes like that. Don't get me wrong. It's not all wine and cheese, but... Uh, uh, right. You're but, right. But, but I was amazed at how many episodes were f- so focused and it had stories like that with, as they, as they said, pro-social values. Yeah. And it was really, I'm like, wow, what was everybody so upset about back then, really? I know. You know? I know. Well, I remember seeing books written on the subject of, um, uh, it was, it was uh, two evangelical Christians. It was a husband and wife, mm-hmm. and they wrote this book about how it was a di- dissection of the He-Man story. Yeah. And it was it, it, making the case of how it was ultimately a satanic property because mm-hmm. uh, Adam, Adam. Right. Uh, uses supernatural power, you know. He he imbues himself with supernatural power to fight, uh, you know, the natural right. citizens of Eternia. Mm-hmm. And it was making the case how Skeletor was a demonized version of humanity because he's the natural person there after all. Uh, he lives there, and He Man comes from uh, beyond through this chant that he makes through his sword. You know, it was it was a very flimsy argument. But I remember it, I, I read I read part of the book, <laughs> and I remember like going, "Have you ever watched this show?" <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like they needed an internet forum, then, right? <laughs> like He Man dot org, right? Invent right. um, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so more ten thousand feet up kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. I'm going to come at you, Kevin. I'm going to say sure. uh, fantasy stories are about conflict. It's Always, about yeah. conflict. So mm-hmm. the heroes should fight. If you make a hero yeah. who doesn't want to fight, you just baked a wimp into the story. Uh, Aang, Avatar mm-hmm. Aang, total sissy. Doesn't like to hurt people. Uh, the doctor yes. always tries to find another way out of the mm-hmm. problem. Yep. Sometimes his hand is forced. Sure. And when, and especially the 10th doctor, when that happens, he says, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> God, that's creepy. <laughs> I should say, I started watching Doctor Who, the new ones, just uh-huh, recently. Yeah. It was after I met you. Uh-huh. And it took a long time to get over not thinking that was you on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, Kevin, get out of there, you know? <laughs> oh, that's not Kevin. Uh, but uh, but no, yeah, I think about like the episode where uh, the, the, there become, the, the this woman becomes like the queen of the Cybermen. And it's yes. in 18th century London. Mm-hmm. And she's like got like a giant Cyberman. And she's inside it. And the right. Doctor says to her is like i'll help you you don't have to do this i will help you yeah. you know raise a cyberman army in a place where there aren't people they could do a whole new planet if you want a whole new planet <laughs> you don't have we don't have to fight and she's and it, this happens time and time again in, in the 10th doctor series mm-hmm. and i just love it every time it happens is the villain says no i'm gonna kill everybody because i can what are you gonna do about it and then he's <laughs> like i'm so sorry and he, what does he do he's got this tool mm-hmm. that is not an instrument of destruction it's right. a screwdriver <laughs> fixes things and what does he do he points at her and he like he does something to the cybernetics point in her head that like reveals her true nature or something like yeah, that. her humanity it reveals her humanity it, like it re- restores her humanity so she can see what she's become yeah and that's when she sees that she causes her own destruction so yeah. he didn't even do it no, right, right. <laughs> So, I mean, I wonder if you could answer this argument of Mm -hmm. if they don't fight, you know, is the 10th Doctor a sissy because he never punches anybody? Is He-Man a sissy because he never punches anybody? Well, I think what it points to is is we have, I guess, two trains of thought in... uh we're gonna get deep here, ready? Well, let's, let's talk about this. Uh, I, I'll preface this by saying yes. there's that everybody's gonna be thinking about that Colin Stokes TED talk about mm-hmm. what movies teach us about manhood. I don't exactly. know if you've seen that. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. and this is a hot topic. Is this whole definition of, of manhood. Exactly. Yeah. What, what, what? You know, does might make right? Is yeah. I guess kind of the the head question. Yeah. Does uh, you know we we're, we're taught that uh, strength and and pushing our way through and dominating is is the way to get ahead, and in some regards that does work. Um, however, what I, I, I find interesting, why are these characters so popular? Why is Aang a popular character when, at best, he likes to use his air to push enemies away? <laughs> yeah. Okay, when in the end, he could have killed the, uh, the Fire Lord, but he just simply took away his bending. Yeah. You know, why is the Doctor so popular over, you know, my gosh. 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. Why is this character so popular when he, all he does is he uses his intelligence to find solutions out of a problem instead of, you know, just simply destruction and, 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 and killing? I believe it's popular because deep inside of us, that's what we really want to be. We don't want to be, you know, people who rain violence on other people. At least I hope not. Yeah. You know, uh, we are popular because it's, it brings out something that we feel in us is the best. 
you know, these are people who are finding these solutions that we want to find. You know, our instinct, I think, as people sometimes are to take the barbarian way out. Mm -hmm. But to see characters who embody the ideals that we want to aspire to are what really inspire us. You know, I wonder if there's like a reverse catharsis at work with that kind of thing that you're talking about, because I will admit that I watch Arnold Schwarzenegger movies like mm -hmm. Commando, like Running Man. Sure. And there's a catharsis at work there <laughs> with watching him. Like, in the ending of Commando, I've counted. He kills over 90 people in the end of that movie. <laughs> you said you killed me last. I lied. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's something that just feels, you know, it's like, oh, that guy deserved it. He was a creep. He right. said all those filthy things to that woman. Yeah, he deserves to be dropped down that pit. Uh, <laughs> but when I, when I read stories and watch stories about characters like Aang, mm -hmm. where, I mean, in the season finale or series finale of The Last Airbender, there's a lot of soul searching going on. There's a lot of him walking around going, I don't want to do this. I don't. Right. And everybody else is saying, you got to kill him. You got to kill him. There's no other way. All of his past lives, you got to kill him. Here's five examples of how I killed somebody. Right. You got to kill somebody. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, all the wise people in the world, all the Obi-Wan Kenobi ghosts, come on, go kill him. Exactly. And Aang's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, if you don't, you just betrayed all your friends. Way to go, selfish loser. And yep. yet he finds a way. And like that moment when he turns blue and then Fire Lord yeah. does, I turns blue. Man, it just, oh, I, I watched the, the series finale th like three times in a row in a hotel yeah. room. Because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get enough of that moment. It's great. But it's not catharsis. I don't know what mm -hmm. it is. What is that? I mean, it, I guess it's, it's aspiration? It is. I really believe it is. I, see, that, that's the thing. It, 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 it felt better. That, you know, the commando stuff, like you said, catharsis, it's kind of like eating Doritos. Yeah. You like it while you're eating it, but you feel like crap afterward, right? <laughs> Where the other stuff, that's your health food. Uh, that's that's gonna that's gonna you know, it's it's not only gonna make you feel good, but yeah. it's also gonna inspire you to something better. Oh, yeah, but health food gets a bad rap <laughs> though. You know, it's like it's like eat your veggies, kid. Watch Eat Man. You know, ah, oh, I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, so let let me come at you again. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you another devil's advocate question. Okay. Um, sure. So then, in other words, these heroes are pretty much in the purview of the morality play. Is that always the case? I think so. I think so. But what, what's interesting about a, a character that won't choose violence is you can also see the self-doubt in them. Mm. You can see that there is faults in them as well. It, mm. it brings their personal struggles more to the forefront, I think, than a warrior character does. How so? Well, He-Man struggles within himself all the time. Mm. He's, he's up against these characters who are evil constantly, and he could just, you know, he could use his power to completely wipe them out and the problem would be gone. That's true. That's true. I mean, he is the most powerful man exactly. in the universe. But he, you know, yeah. he has to struggle with that. He has to struggle with the fact that eventually, you know, in the Mike Young productions, we eventually come to find out that really Skeletor is originally Keldor, who is his uncle. He's related to spoilers. him. Spoilers. You know, spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even in the original mini comics, that's where the direction of the storyline was going. Mm. And uh, you know, so it's not just you know, the enemy is not always something that is just simply vanquishable in one fell swoop. It's something that has to be dealt with on a, you know, on a daily basis. And it's the same thing in reality. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to generalize and call, you know, here's something good and here's something evil, but evil is out there. And it's yeah. out there all the time. And it's not so much about how we butt our heads against it to vanquish it. It's about how we learn to deal with it. Yeah. You know, it's about how we learn to find ways around it, to work with it, and to make our lives and others better, despite it. There's, there's, uh, the episode Quest for the Sword, uh, mm -hmm. where He-Man, in, in, the, in the course of saving some children from an earthquake, his sword gets taken by a rock creature named Raybar. Mm -hmm. And Raybar goes underground to his people. And uh, his people are normally very peaceful, but now that he's got a sword, and he's seen how people use swords in the outside world. He's like, I'm in charge now. I'm the boss. I got a sword. I'm yeah. a leader. And He-Man comes up to him. <laughs> John Irwin's performance is so fantastic because he's like, the first thing he says is like, why don't you give me my sword back and just be a great guy? <laughs> <laughs> and then Raybar starts trying to fight yeah. him. Uh, but then he gets down into the pit, follows Raybar down to try to get the sword back, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Man at Arms uh, like, says, you're going to have to fight him for it. And He-Man says, I won't. These people don't know the meaning of violence, and mm -hmm. I won't be the one to teach them. Yeah, hey, that's right. Yeah, and and and... It would be so easy, you mm -hmm. know, to just pick the guy up, throw him in a mud puddle like he does the Beast Man, take the sword right. away by force, but he won't do it. And he even loses the sword into the center of the earth at one point yeah. as a result of that choice. Mm -hmm. So those choices often make things way harder for the hero yeah. in those situations. I think there's way more drama mm -hmm. in that. But again, he was playing the example, like these other characters are, these altruistic heroes, are playing mm -hmm. the example for other people yeah. to see. 
he taught the you know he was teaching those rock people that you know violence isn't the answer. The doctor is always teaching his companions violent isn't the, violence isn't the answer. That's, yeah, I, that's I, changed a little bit in the new series. <laughs> but we won't we won't go there. Well, actually, at the conclusion of what, what was it? The conclusion of uh, series six, the Matt Smith series, yeah. where the, the Dalek King comes back. Uh, oh, what's his name? The, the guy who created the Daleks. Oh, uh, Davros. Oh, series Davros. 4. End of Series 4. Yeah. End of Series 4. And he kind of makes an accusation of right. like, yeah, oh, you think your hands are so clean. Right. But look at all of your companions and friends who do all your dirty work for you, mm -hmm. right? Or was that, am I thinking? No, that was Davros. Davros, that's the, right. Okay. Yeah, he did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and that's, that's the other thing is that he, the, the, the doctor always has to live in doubt of that as well. Right, right. Is that because mm -hmm. he's always forced into these adventures where he has to, you mm -hmm. know, encounter somebody who wants to use force over him. Right. Um, force happens, it right? Does. And what does that do to the people around him, right. kind of thing? Uh, and it always starts with him just, just very uh, cheerfully inviting them to go on an adventure with him. It yeah. always starts out so sweet, you know. It's like, <laughs> hey, hey, girl in an alley, you want right, to go on right. a ride? And right. then it's like, oh, I wrecked her life. <laughs> exactly. They find some way to, to to break hearts and draw tears. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whereas before in the classic series, they just say, okay, bye, see ya. <laughs> Oh, I have person. I, I just started revisiting the Tom Baker series, and yeah. I haven't seen how his, his companion in that one, uh, how they part ways. Oh, yeah, it's, so it's it's oh, just they'll just let her leave. I'll just okay. Oh. <laughs> So it gets so, some of them are more heartbreaking than others, but never, but yeah, not quite as detailed as the new series. So Tom Baker doesn't destroy a son to say goodbye no. to his companion. No, <laughs> uh, okay, but <laughs> I'm wondering. You were hinting earlier. I think I heard words in what you were saying that says something about dealing with evil. <laughs> Dealing with it instead of vanquishing it. I wonder if this is also part of this whole bucket of compassion that usually surrounds these oh, yeah. characters. Mm -hmm. You know, I was hinting or talking earlier about the episode where He Man saves Merman, and Teal's like, "Oh, he, did, he risked everything to save him." Yeah. It's like every life is worth saving, even yes. an evil one, because uh, because nothing's completely black and white. Yeah, you know, that's what I liked about the show. They always show that even these characters who you think are so evil. There's possibly something in them that they could, you know, they could turn around. Actually, know. they did that a lot more in the Mike Young series, too, didn't yeah. they? Mm -hmm. They really did reveal that all these guys, like, have some element of, they just, like, like Stinkor, we just watched that yesterday, Stinkor. He just wants to be in a club, for crying out loud. That's right. all he wants. He's not evil, per se. He's got a bad way of expressing his desires. Yeah. He just wants to be in the in crowd. He just wants to be acknowledged as someone cool. <laughs> right, and, and who doesn't have that, that feeling once in a yeah. while, right? Mm -hmm. That's a perfectly human way to feel. So, uh. So I like this idea too that these characters inspire compassion, whereas mm -hmm. uh, you know John Matrix in Commando, not <laughs> not necessarily inspiring compassion. Uh, but this this idea of physical power too, mm -hmm. of only being as good as the person using it. Uh, I'm wondering. I'm wondering. You know, there's a lot of superhero movies coming out, and yeah. there's a lot of action and, and sometimes scary violence in these things. Um, you know, I made no secret about how the fact that, that uh, Pacific Rim, I thought, was a little too frightening, a little too dark for me, personally. Yeah. Uh, it was cool robots, but it was a little, <laughs> a little scary. Uh, and, and, like, and part of the problem I had with it, too, was the fact that the, the villains didn't really feel like they had much motivation. They were just kind of wild animals. And so then it was like watching people chop up wild animals, right. which isn't right. interesting to me. Mm -hmm. But um, I forget where I was going with this now. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering why we only see these kind of characters every once in a while. You know, is 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 it a fashion thing, or is it like a is it is it a difficulty thing? Do you think? And I'm just asking you to hypothesize. I mean, I don't. I know none of us know the answer to this. Yeah, but I know it's it's. I I think it is difficult. I think it is difficult to kind of to, to walk that line. It's it's much easier to have, like I said, a more black and white story of good versus evil. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that specifically. I mean, I think it, it, it's, it certainly has something to offer, you know, our imaginations, and it's something that we certainly, uh, like I said, kind of digest a little easier. Mm -hmm. but, but I think uh, w when you set up a story like, let me just use Star Trek for an example, yeah. um, especially Next Generation when that came around, because I remember reading stories about the writers, and because and, and, Gene Roddenberry was still alive when that got restarted, uh, his missive was, is this, the, the, our crew characters can't argue with each other. They can't have conflict with each other. We're, we've moved past that point. We've mm -hmm. evolved past that point. And the writers are just like, are you joking me? This is ridiculous. And it didn't, wasn't until, like, uh, I think Michael Piller came in, and he absolutely embraced that as a challenge for storytelling. And that's when the series really started getting good because you saw all these external conflicts coming around that everybody worked together to figure out. Yeah. And you were really left with this really, you know, feeling of overcoming something with a group. You know what I mean? So there was a different way of telling. It was definitely a different way of telling stories. Mm -hmm. And that kind of changed a little bit with Deep Space Nine. And their focus was a little bit different with, you know, and they had a lot of inter-character conflict. Mm 
Right. But and then Voyager too, because you had two Voyager, crews. Right. Right. And, after and all. Uh, but I feel like it's it's it, it is definitely more difficult because you have to think a little because we always have the hero's journey uh, standard in mm -hmm. storytelling that we've always kind of been taught in the stories we read. We've got the Beowulf story. We've got the all these ancient tales that are always, like I said, the very black and white, good versus evil, might fight. Mm -hmm. You know. And so the different approach of taking someone who, I don't want to say a more pacifistic pr approach, but they have a different way of dealing with that conflict mm -hmm. is always a little bit more difficult to us instinctually. I mean, I don't know if I'm talking circles around that, but I think, I think it is a difficulty factor. Yeah. But there is ways to do it, and I think it's so much more creatively satisfying to see the solutions that you know, writers or storytellers come up with uh, to solve that problem because yeah. it, it stretches our imagination. It's not just oh I'm gonna get these these guys here and they're gonna they're gonna basically do this. Ah, <laughs> 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 victorious! <laughs> right, right. You know, it, it it comes up with something a little bit more creative, and I think that that uh, satisfies our need for good storytelling. Were you the kind of kid who internalized this stuff when you were young, or or was it just it kind of like it it hit the the cortex in there, and but it wasn't until you got older that it started to make sense to you? Because I'll, I'll I'll bring up an example sure. of this. I was a weird kid, like a lot of people in comics are. Uh, you know, I collected strawberry shortcakes in first grade, and yeah. I brought them to show and tell. Oh gosh! In 1981. I'm not the only one. <laughs> but I, it was a different time. I don't know if I should admit that. <laughs> Did you really? Oh yeah. No, I always, I was, I hate to say this. I always loved the villain characters in those things. Yeah, Purple like, Pie Man. Yeah, and yeah. Professor Coldheart and all. That oh yeah, things. yeah, Professor Coldheart. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can still sing a song, which I won't do. You know. <laughs> I'm cold so, and cruel and nasty. Might those those the are the part. only ones my parents would buy me. They wouldn't buy me the girly toys. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted them all, but yeah, uh, yeah, and I've, I've talked too. about it. I talked about it on the show before, but uh, but 1981. Right. We're not that far out from the 60s. There are still, you know, the idea of the housewife being, right. you know, like nothing wrong with being a housewife, mm -hmm. but like that was like the role, you know, yeah. like being a working mom back then was weird, you know. Mm -hmm. So for this boy to come to school and be like, I like strawberry shortcakes, don't tell. <laughs> you can imagine what that what that brought down on me. There were a lot right. of Nelsons in the school that I sure. went to uh, in the country, like out in you know uh, northern Michigan. So, um, and so I'm watching this He-Man show and I'm internalizing this stuff. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. sometimes people who act the worst need our help the most. So I'll just talk to him. <laughs> I'll just talk to that kid who's giving cool. me a hard time. Yeah. Didn't stop him. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> well, we really need to talk about this. Pow, 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 right? Right. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, this makes us feel good as adults. I wonder if did, it's useful did, to did kids. Did it work for kids? Y you know, I think... I think maybe you don't realize the fruits of that until later in your life. Yeah. You start to realize the, how it shaped you. I think you're yeah. right. I think as kids, you don't necessarily see it. I think as kids, you see the cool characters. Ooh, they're all brightly colored. Yeah. They're, goof they're goofy. They're cool. And then you stop and you look back. Like I said, like I watched the show on DVD again. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what I was watching. Yeah. How nice is that? Remember the morals at the end of each episode? Oh, yeah. And they would do some of those. I'm going to tell you, some of those were really deep. There was the one um, where Tila, it explores Tila's origins. Oh, yeah, yeah, And the yeah. moral at the end of that episode was all about how he wasn't her natural father, but he was her father because he cared and loved for her. The people who care and love for us, they're, they're the people we call mother, and, mother father. and father. Oh, my God. That was the deepest moral message I've ever seen in a kid's show ever. And, and for the time, too. Absolutely. For the time, too. Where, where I mean, like, divorce was still, like, yes. a heavily stigmatized thing, uh -huh. you know? And it was weird to be, you know, to yeah. not have a traditional mom and dad family. Exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, other morals were like, don't put mustard on the cat. You know, I mean, it was... <laughs> Make sure, well, there, was a, there was a lot of, like, don't judge people by their appearances. Yeah, yeah, there was yeah, yeah. a ton of those. But, but, but there were other ones, like I said, that were really, you know, you don't, I think as a kid you don't realize when you're watching them just how important they are. Yeah. But they, they, you know, they, they're there. You, you can't take something back once you put it out there. And they put that good stuff out there, and I think it's settled and it grew. You put a little seed in someone, and it grows eventually. Well, I'll tell you another thing I think of is when I was, this would be like around fifth, sixth grade for me, um, and, you know, as you pointed out, like, we, we move on from things. So, like, He-Man yeah. quickly became like, well, that's that was when I was in third grade right, after yeah, all, yeah. and now it's G.I. Joe and Transformers. <laughs> uh, but they started introducing these characters, like Lifeline in G.I. Joe, who yeah. was a medic pacifist. Mm. He wouldn't even touch guns on mm -hmm. the show. And they played it kind of corny sometimes, but... As a kid, I remember this was my introduction to the notion of pacifism. Yeah. Like, oh, mm -hmm. it's not weird that I think fighting is scary, and right. and I don't like it very much, uh, and I don't want to lord power over my friends, that uh, sure. I'd rather get along with people, and that there's another option. Mm -hmm. uh, Transformers had a character named First Aid. They did a whole episode about his pacifism. 
So I think that even if the kids aren't necessarily like being able to write a paper right, about sure. it, being offered that option is, I think, a very important thing. Not I to get so too, too moralistic about no, it. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's impressive to see that even though that was an era of extreme commercialization in yeah. cartoons, I mean, these, these essentially, when you're going to break it down, a good part of it was a half-hour advertisement for toys. Let's just be honest, right? Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. But I'm pleased to say that there were those things. The writers of the show, they gave their all. You know, they, they were working for a paycheck, obviously. They, they, you know, I didn't think they'd ever think years later there'd be these adult fans coming to them and thanking them for doing what they were doing. Right. You know, but they bothered, and they had the chutzpah to go out there and uh, write something that was something pro-social. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Showing kids these other avenues of, of problem solving and conflict resolution. And I think one of the things I often say on these shows when we talk about this topic is I say in watching them in the spirit that they were intended is yes. important. Absolutely. And that's why you see like those He-Man parody videos online because when you watch it in the spirit not intended, if you watch it as a 19-year-old, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with that 19-year-old worldview, yeah, it breaks. It's it's absurd. It You know, uh, it... it Ram Man, like, where's your neck? I don't know, you know, <laughs> like, that's a, a line in the show. Uh, and actually, there's a great episode, uh, Not So Blind. Do you remember that one with the little the blind boy loose? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a line in there at the beginning of the episode where, like, um, the, I, I feel like the writers had to do this on purpose. <laughs> they, po they have Adam surrounded by kids who are asking questions about He-Man, mm -hmm. and it's almost like listening to a bunch of teenagers, uh, you know, Sort of yeah. try to dissect the show. And they're like, how come Skeletor always gets away? How come He-Man does, just doesn't just beat him up? And Adam's answering the questions as best he can. <laughs> <laughs> I love that scene. But yeah. which leads me to mm -hmm. um, top episodes. So somebody's mm -hmm. watching this. Somebody's okay. listening to this. And they're like, uh, okay, maybe I'll give it a try again. Yes. Uh, and I get asked this a lot. What are the top episodes? I've got, I've actually got 10. <laughs> okay, okay. But I want to hear yours. Okay, so I gave you Dragon's Gift. I gave you Problem with Power. Right. Yeah. Okay. Rainbow Warrior. Ah. Queen Marlena's origin story. Yeah. Okay, and it's not just because it's her origin story, but it also, I just gotta say, so many of my favorite episodes when I wrote them up, I'm noticing they're all female centric. Mm -hmm. It's really being really great episodes, and that's something that they really did in filmation. They really promoted the idea of women and young girls having a lot of influence, a lot of a personal ability, and a lot of uh, you know opportunity to shine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And in this episode, Queen Marlena really saves the day. Mm -hmm. ultimately you know what i mean it not only shows her origin coming to eternia which is just cool to see because origin stories are really cool and as a nasa fan her last name is glenn exactly that's she, pretty cool she's, you know astronaut from earth yeah but she also is the one who in the end of the day you know saves everybody even he-man yeah you know uh, is that the one when she hints that she knows that adam is yes. he-man mm -hmm. yeah she's like a mother just knows what her son is capable exactly. of with a wink yeah, which you know? is great too yeah that is a great, great line and uh, another one i had is tila's triumph which one is this? which is a where she um Basically, the sorceress gets trapped in another dimension, and she has to start taking over trying to be the sorceress, and then she kind of like plays and puts on the costume and tries to pretend it's her, and that's when they start to kind of like understand, or she starts to sort of realize that I'm her daughter, yeah. or, you know, that I don't, and I didn't really realize that that kind of a thing, and, and the sorceress has to say, I have to keep this secret, I can't really just out and tell her. And so, but, but there's a reason that you reason. have to take my place, yeah, right. it's yeah, like heavily thing. implied, right? Exactly, and so that's, that's kind of a nice thing whenever they played on that larger story at hand. That is cool too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, it it the narrative arc of that is that Tila's like, I am not ready for this. Right. Right. I'm not mm -hmm. a sorceress. I'm the captain of the guard. What am I supposed to do here? And they're yeah. like, Nope. You just it's it's a nice thing to say. I, I as somebody who is hesitant to buy into stories where it's like you're the chosen one. Yeah. You're the special one. Aang notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. Uh but like you're the special one that has to do the special thing after all. I like the idea the way they phrased it in there where like this it's in you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you try hard enough, it's in you. And that's, I think, a broader message to give yes. to children. Like, the, mm -hmm. the, the capacity to do great things is in you, kid, watching this show right, right now, right? Exactly. Um, and plus, uh, was it Linda Gary who played all the females? Yes. She right. played, like, every pretty, one. Pretty much everyone, yeah. Except there's, there's for a couple, couple other ones. A couple ones that Erica Scheimer would play. You could tell <laughs> Erica Scheimer's voice. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> she played Lookie yeah. on uh, uh, the She-Ra. She played Queen Marlena yeah. a couple times, but most of the time it was Linda Gary. But Linda Gary played the sorceress and Tila. Mm -hmm. And it's distinct enough when you hear them talking to right. each other. But then Tila has to pretend to be the sorceress. And I love that mm -hmm. performance moment of her 
having to perform Tila performing the sorceress. Yes. So this recursive kind of thing. Exactly. Going on. Anyway, Which is saying, great because there's a lot of trivia behind the character of the sorceress slash goddess slash Tila and the creation of the toy line. But you can get into that later if we have time. Oh, oh, if you want. We can go there now if you want. I want to hear it. I okay, well, when they originally designed the toy line, you may yeah. have remembered that Tila came with a, a weird cobra hat, right? That's right. So, you know, you got the Tila figure here. And the idea was is when you bought the figure, you were buying two figures because you had the one that was Tila, Captain of the Guard, and then ah. you also had <laughs> decapitation. You also had this character. It was supposed to be a different character with this cobra head that was supposed to be this character called the goddess. Mm -hmm. And she was in the early mini comics when Mattel was the only person making the storyline. There was no filmation involved yet. She was supposed to be the one that was, in, you know, in Castle Grayskull, protecting over the secrets and presented He-Man initially with the sword, the power That's sword. That's right. And the sorceress figure wasn't released till after the no, cartoon. No, So it was actually filmation that created the sorceress based on this concept of the goddess. And she was a clone. T or Tila was a clone of the, the goddess. Oh. And there's a whole mini comic that I think that came with Trapjaw that dealt with that. Oh, wow. And uh, so that, 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 that idea carried through into the filmation series where they, they designed, they wanted to design a whole other character because it would look cooler rather than having to have two Tilos walking around. <laughs> uh, but the same thing, they made her her daughter as opposed to like just a clone. And, and she happens to be the daughter of the sorceress and right. King Grayskull, right? Um, or no? It depends which series, which continuity you go for. <laughs> the Am I talking Mike Young the, now? The Filmation series, they never make it clear she's born from an egg. They have yep. an episode for that. Yep. Uh, the, the Mike Young cartoon, it's never implied who the father is because they didn't finish the series, but it was going to be Fisto. No fooling. Fisto was supposed to be her actual father. So really? man at arms bro and he's Man-at-Arms' brother, of course. Okay, see, it's been a while since so, I watched the John Young series, or, or Mike Young series. Yeah. Uh, i got to go back and rewatch that, because so, I know it goes into a lot of depth right, into these stories. That's what it was going, they never got to tell that story because the series was canceled, uh -huh. but that's where they were going with it. Oh, because I know they revealed that King Grayskull was originally yeah. the owner of Castle Grayskull. Mm -hmm. Yes. So and, I and assumed that he and the sorceress were married, and that's why the sorceress still lives there. He had a different, he had a wife called Vina. Okay. And she was the first sorceress. Okay. And then ever after then, it was kind of passed down to these various women who took on the role of sorceress and, and stayed in the castle and, and kept the secrets safe. And so therefore, folks, that's why he says by the power of Grayskull, mm -hmm. he's calling on the power of King Grayskull, yes. and he, who looks exactly. like He-Man. Yeah. And, and there's a theory now running that who is, who is you know, He-Man and She-Ra are the twins, obviously the chosen twins who wield the power swords and things like that. Mm -hmm. And there's this running theory going around, well, well, Going down the lineage, is it really King Randor and Keldor, Skeletor, who are the, you know, the, the descendants of Grayskull? And there's a theory running around that actually the descendants of Grayskull were sent off-planet as protection, and the real descendant of Grayskull is Marlena. Oh, wow. So they're, they're, they're descendants from Grayskull via her. And, and there's a theory. Like I said, it hasn't been confirmed yet. There's, there's various, you know. Is there a chance we'll find out in some of the new Hopefully. Iterations? Well, that's, that's what we're looking for in the bios of this new classics line. That's kind of the storyline that uh, ah. we're, waiting, we're waiting to see happens in the bios of the, the figures as they're coming out. There's some secret uh, that, that Marleta finds linking Earth to Eternia. I'm so, so happy that there's dig deeper places to dig in this franchise. Yes. Because, and, like, <laughs> and, and the thing is, it's always you can choose what continuity you want. If you don't like true. that storyline, there's other storylines out there. And I think Mattel has done a great job. The brand manager, uh, Scott Knightlick, who's in charge now, has always said, you know, there's, there's the Mike Young continuity, there's Filmation continuity, there's um, all these continuities, and then there's the continuity that you made up yourself as a kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's just as valid and just as important. That's awesome. In terms of how you, you make the storyline happen. Uh, okay, I want to get to your final picks. Fin final final pick. Okay, final pick. Last one is, is number five, and I cheated on this one because it's technically five episodes, but it's been presented as a full-length movie. That is true. Which is The Secret of the Sword. Secret of the Sword. Which is She-Ra's origin story and the Horde, which are my bros. <laughs> the Horde is introduced. And uh, it's the whole reason I watched She-Ra as a kid but told no one, because the Horde were awesome, but you can't, you can't admit watching She-Ra. Even, even though, quite frankly, even that was a great show for, you know, showing young girls, you know. Well, I was going to ask, uh -huh. who, who would win in a fight, He-Man or She-Ra? Right? I oh mean, well, I know that's, that's, a, that's a total dork nerd question. Right, right, right. But, you know, it's like they've talked about this on the Masters cast in the past, mm -hmm. is that she is actually, in significant ways, more powerful than He-Man. Her sword can do more, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, there's the, the, there were some examples where they were showing, like, she lifted a bigger thing kind of thing, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't have to go there. But just in terms of capability and prowess. She, she may be, but it's interesting that, if you notice, when the, sword, the power sword is cloned by the sorceress so that the twins could wield both a sword of power, he-Man's is called the, the Sword of Power. Mm -hmm. Hers is called the Sword of Protection. Mm. 
So even though she might have a greater power, her role is not to so much be the aggressor, it's to be the protector. Interesting. Which is interesting. Well, what's e equally interesting about that is the fact that they set up the world to be the inverse of Eternia in right. that the Horde runs everything, and she's she's the outsider. She's right. the rebellion. He-Man's the keeper of the peace. Mm -hmm. She's the leader of the, of of the re rebellion. Of rebellion against an establishment, yeah. Yeah, so like there's an inherently aggressive right. stance to her position in that story, mm -hmm. yet she has the sort of protection. Right. And he said, and He Man says, for the power of Grayskull, she says, for the honor, honor of, Grayskull. of Grayskull. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I always thought it was fascinating, even as a kid, that, like, whoa, like, He Man's sword can't turn into rope. He Man's sword can't turn into <laughs> I fire. Know, right? He Man's sword can't turn into, a, like, a helmet to protect her underwater. And, and, I, and frankly, as cool as Battle Cat is, I think it'd be a lot easier to have a flying horse to get to places, right? <laughs> That's true. That's true. He Man's stuck to land travel. Yeah. Swift wind can go anywhere. I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but there was no, a question please. I got to ask at PowerCon one year because I was watching the show again, and I, and I thought it was so funny. You know, they were forced, of course, not so much forced, but it was the agreement, of course, is that when new toys came out, they had to put new toys in the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about getting places not very fast, <laughs> one of the vehicles was called the Dragon Walker. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the coolest toy ever. It's, it's this dragon head on the base of these two feet, and it was mechanical, and the foot would swing around slowly, and then the head would move, and then the foot would, you know... It was this cool little mechanical thing. Look it up on YouTube. Look up Dragon Walker commercial on yeah. Vintage Commercial. Anyway, it's in, it's in the toy show, and they're like, Men at Arms, we have to get here to Snake Mountain quickly. <laughs> He's like, Let's take the Dragon Walker. Okay. And they hop yeah. in the Dragon Walker, and then it's on the cartoon, and it does exactly what the toy does, and they're going like, you know. Yeah, step. step and you're like, wow, I guess they didn't need to get there that quickly. <laughs> And, I've, and I asked them, I said, was that always kind of frustrating to have to, like, put this stuff in here and you're trying to tell this immediate the tragic story? And they're like, they said, not really. They said, they didn't interfere too much. Our agreement was we had to put the, the toys in there. Yeah. Said, but our agreement with Mattel was, we won't tell you how to make toys. Don't tell us how to make cartoons. Oh. And so they gave them a free hand in their storytelling. Well, that's good. Because, uh, yeah, you always do, like, a quick cut. But, yeah, right. I remember the episode you're talking about. And, yeah, yeah. I, I remember even as a kid, I, 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 you know, coveted the attack track so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who didn't want the attack track, which they modified a lot for the filmation right. show. But for those who don't remember, the attack track was basically a four-wheel drive car, but instead of wheels, it had ovals, like these oblong rectangles. Kind of for... like oh, single-axle tank treads. Yeah, 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 that's a good way of putting it. And so like the, the treads would kind of thrust forward and grab <laughs> the ground, which made it like this really cool all-terrain vehicle. And I just remember my, my dad, as I was looking at it, going like, oh, dad, this would be a great Christmas present, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and, and, my, and my dad looks at it, he's like, that thing would give such terrible gas mileage. <laughs> it's so impractical. I'm like, but it looks awesome. It slams these giant, you know, oblong wheels on the ground in front oh of it. Gosh. But yeah, there are a lot of extraordinarily impractical vehicles oh, yes. in Eternia. But that goes back to that terrific kid logic. I wasn't right. questioning it. I was just mm -hmm. looking at it going like, that looks cool. Exactly. Right? Uh, we could use more kid logic in, mm -hmm. in our entertainment these we days. Um, anyway, you had favorite episodes. I, didn't I did. I did. Uh, oh. And a lot of them, you, you covered a lot of mine. I had the Rainbow Warrior. Yep. Um, I've got uh, Quest for the Sword. Like I said, yes. that's the one with the rock men. Mm -hmm. And the, when He-Man says, I won't, those these people don't know the meaning of, of fighting. I won't be the one to teach them. I fall apart every time yeah. I watch that. Uh, somebody asked me recently, he's like, oh, it'd be really cool if you did some audio commentaries on the He-Man episodes, which mm -hmm. you can actually find at he, uh, the He-Man YouTube channel, right? Yes, yes. James Etock is doing that. Yeah. He's a uh, filmation and, and He-Man historian, and there's so many incredible things that he has dug up yeah. about, like, the initial how Battle Cat was supposed to speak during the transformation sequence. And, and, how and they, the recent yeah. one with the origin of the Masters of the Universe yes. name. Like, what uh -huh. does it mean? What does exactly. it refer to? Yeah. So many great things come out of that. Is he the guy who did the Serial Geek magazine? Or am I thinking of somebody else? I think he is involved with that. Okay. Um, I, you're, he's at least associated he is with his, it. He's, he's written a couple books about it, yeah. He-Man and... and Filmation, so very knowledgeable mm -hmm. fellow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, you can. They got. They're doing commentary tracks on the episodes, and they're fantastic. But anyway, mm -hmm. like, so when I got asked about, it, I was like, I said to the guy, I'm like, you really want to listen to me completely fall apart at the 16 minute mark over and over <laughs> again? No, you don't want to listen to that, because that's what happens with all the ones I've got listed here. Yeah. Um, Prince Adam No More, mm -hmm. uh, story of a father and son. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes. Uh, also has the wonderful line of like, you know, when you were given He-Man's powers, it was for a reason to help other people. No mm -hmm. one said you could use it to make yourself happy. Yeah. You know, uh, right. so good. Uh, Dragon's Gift, obviously agree with you hundred sure. percent. Uh, Wizard of Stone Mountain. Uh, and I've talked about this on the Saturday Supercast. Mm -hmm. Uh, if people want to go back and listen to those, Wizard of Stone Mountain is the one with Malak, the sorcerer who yes. loves okay. Tila. Mm -hmm. Flimsy motivation for the for the villain. He's just like, I just love Tila so much, and he never says why. He never yeah, says what yeah. it is about her that he's so compelling. But then this demon shows up yeah. and says, like, well, I can give her to you for mm -hmm. a price. He's like, I'll give you anything. 
and it turns out the demon is working for essentially Satan. <laughs> and uh, but they never say Satan. No, no. they never well, say. That he, what's what's interesting about this is is yeah. most of the old Masters of the Universe episodes. As I'm watching it, I'm like, this is so 1970s D and D. Yeah, it's like all the writers. They were like, here's a barbarian story. Write something about it. They didn't really have too deep of a Bible. I'm like, well, I can draw my knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons. And they and you find so many of those D and D elements were thrown into the He-Man filmation cartoons, especially in like the first season. Yeah, yeah. Especially, so that's, especially, and so. that's one of them. And know. I remember on one of the uh, audio commentaries or featurettes on the BCI DVDs mm -hmm. that were released, one of the writers, it might have been Robbie London, I can't remember for sure, but he said uh, when he wrote the scripts at first, he took out the name He-Man and just put in some ba barbarian name because yeah. he couldn't take, <laughs> he couldn't take a, a barbarian. Story seriously, where it's like he man. <laughs> well, you gotta remember that that word meant something totally yeah, right. different before Mattel created that character, right? <laughs> the man who is he. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so yeah. Satan himself shows up and announces himself, and he, the, the design is goofy. He looks like a Christmas tree of fire, <laughs> but but and he doesn't call himself Satan. No. He says, "I am evil itself." Right. And there's this great moment where he tries to crush He-Man with his big fire hand, and He-Man pushes him back, and he says, like, your goodness is equal to my dark power. I could fight you for years and never win. And He-Man just smiles and says, I'm ready if you are. <laughs> He-Man's ready to fight for years! That's right, the ultimate evil. <laughs> if it's Satan, he'll do it, you know? Don't, don't, <laughs> don't tempt him. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like he wouldn't do that to any of, like, Skeletor's warriors because mm -hmm. they're people. But yeah. this is evil but itself. It, it's it's a classic temptation story, yeah. you know, which is great, and and it, it really shows that hey, you know, evil's out there, temptation's out there, and you can fight back <laughs> if you have the fortitude to do it. <laughs> uh, that that is, is so good. Uh, and then let's see if I have one more that I could recommend. Uh, Heart of a Giant. Um, hmm. You remember mm -hmm. this one? I this do. is this is the one where. Um, Orko and Man at Arms and Adam are just out looking for this weed for Man at Arms experiments, and they run into this big giant, and they're like, and Orko's like, it's a monster! It must yeah, be a monster because yeah. it's scary. Um, and meanwhile, there's this collector who we, they never name. It's so weird. No. The collector never gets named in the episode, but he's collecting all sorts of um, freaks and curiosities from around Eternia for a traveling sideshow. Yeah. And uh, what I love about it is the solution to the problem. I mean, I'll spoil it for everybody because sure. it's not like you can really worry about <laughs> spoiling a filmation show, but. Uh, you know, He-Man solves the problem by just freeing the monsters. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? The guy who captures all these monsters turns into a coward. He's only brave if everybody else is powerless, right? Yeah. And that's a bully. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the story of bullying. And then, and then when the monsters are all converging on the guy who caged them, the giant steps forward and speaks for the first time. He never spoke before. He lived as a hermit because mm -hmm. everybody treated him poorly. Uh, and he's like, don't spoil your freedom with hate. We have our freedom. It's enough. You know, we beat this guy. Yeah. It's cool. You know, we don't have to beat, we don't have to do to him what he did to us. Yes. Kind of thing. Uh, man. Yeah, right. It's such a good thing for a kid show. Gosh. <laughs> 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 so um, we we are coming up on the end. Okay, so sure. I, I want. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you want to touch uh, on about this He Man stuff that you like so much? Just, just favorite favorite character. Favorite character, M Mantena. Really, Mantena. Which is which is I I have the old Mantena here, of course. I hung on to that figure and with eye popping with action. little eye popping action. <laughs> I just it was just the goofiest character ever. Yeah. There, there we go. And uh, I just love the look of him, and I just love that the new toy series, which is taking the old class, the old classic vintage characters, and they're just kind of updating them. Like I always was angry that he's supposed to have these four legs, right? Yeah. And they were kind of molded into one piece because they didn't have a whole lot of you know technology back then. Well, the new figures, he really does have four legs, which is just like, ah, oh, it's everything. Yeah. It's everything five-year-old Kevin wanted but couldn't have back then. <laughs> and what's great about the the classics line that brand manager Scott Knightlick is in charge of and working on, is this is a subscription um, figure series where you subscribe, and uh, they have some available on day of sale, but it's mostly founded on subscription. Uh, remaking all the old classic toys is they're making not just the old classics and bringing back the old characters again that people love. Mm -hmm. They're also advancing the story forward where it would, would have gone had the toy line not ended. So the toy line would have ended ended in 87 with uh, hints of this new s direction they were taking called the Powers of Grayskull, mm -hmm. where they were going to go back in time. He-Man was going to meet his ancestor, and they were going to find the origin of the Snake Men, and they were going to expand upon that. And the toy line was canceled, of course. Uh. But this new classics toy line has gone forward with that, and they've done more characters from this Powers of Grayskull line. They've made the characters who were prototypes that were never produced, they've remade new figures of the prototype characters and expanded on their story. And now they're going to even go farther into the future with new characters from what would have been the sequel series called Hero, Son of He-Man. 
And so oh, they have yes. all these great new characters that they've, they've brought forth and they've created. So it's fun to, to kind of, of course, look back and, and have all the fun things that you remember as a kid. But they're also going forward with new characters like Castle Grayskull Man, who I'm very honored. I have to have to plug in. Daniel, Please. It's a fellow named Daniel Benedict. I, I'm very honored to say that I, I've been made friends with him at PowerCon, me and Rachel. He's a great guy. He's an f- independent filmmaker. He's made his own independent horror movie uh, called Bunny. Oh, B-U-N-N-I. Wow. B-U-N-N-I. And... Uh, he designed this character in a contest that they held for the Classics line, and it's Castle Grayskull Man, and he's just kind of the embodiment of the 30th anniversary that they had of the Castle Grayskull. They made him into a kind of a character, then they gave him a storyline that fits in with the continuity. Wow. So, and it's great. And he has a website, I think, castlegrayskullman.com, if you want to look that up, where he, he's made these great videos. Okay, he's as a filmmaker. He made, when his character got selected, yeah. he made this great, hilarious commercial that was with the vintage toys with the old gray skull where he introduces his character <laughs> as a vintage toy and these kids are playing with it and you're like he, you're like, did they do it with the his... old like he, he did man, he, man. he did and it's on his website <laughs> go to, to castlegrayskullman.com you click awesome. on the videos link and you can see all the videos he's made which are really really great oh that is and super it's, cool and it's all part of this the spirit of again we joke it's like hey adult male do you want castle gray skull again i'm like well, yeah let's just face it we're all adults we yeah. love this stuff, but now we can love it again, and we can even pass it on to our kids. Yeah. You know? Oh, well, even those of us who don't have kids. You know, right. It keeps the kids and us alive, I think, Amen. a little bit. So Absolutely. Uh, oh, super cool. Kevin, I cannot thank you enough for hey, this it's, conversation. It's this, been so much fun. This uh, is, this is, you know, there's the Doctor Who stuff, which we've talked about. There's the Avatar stuff, and I like those, but this has always kind of been my, my secret closet passion. <laughs> I didn't know this. I didn't know this until you, you brought it up at Kids Read Comics. And then yeah. I was like, oh, brother. Uh, you know, so, yeah. And then I was like, oh, you like He-Man too? Oh, my gosh. We, we got to talk. I don't get to talk to anybody about this. Yeah, same here. Yeah, same right? here. I always, I always become the weirdo uh, talking about this. I always have to, you know, rein it in a little bit in the company of adults. Right. Because, you... although every once in a while, I, I, <laughs> I was at, I was at a, a convention with Dave Roman. This yeah. was a couple of years back. And something happened that I wasn't comfortable with, and I, I, I thought I did something that was inappropriate. And I remember I said involuntarily, like, he man wouldn't have done this. And I was trying to figure out how to do, how to, how to figure out the situation, and that's become kind of a joke uh, after that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but no, thank you so much for making sure. time to be a part of this conversation. It was thank super you. fun for me. Uh, if, where can people find you? Where's the best place to find what you're up to? Oh, my goodness. Um... I know it's been a busy year it's, for it's you. It's been a very busy year, and there hasn't been a whole lot going on that I've done online. Yeah. Openly, I, my DeviantArt page, of course, I update. hasn't been updated in a while, but I do update occasionally with the activities and things that we're doing, especially with uh, the new Avatar stuff coming out on DVD. Um, Facebook as well. i gotta get a, I got to get a, a, a fan Facebook page so I don't have everybody friending me on my personal one. So, yeah. you know, that's for family and friends at the moment. But, uh, yeah, the DeviantArt page is what I, I will advertise for right now until I get something more official. And we can find on the DeviantArt page also a bunch of really awesome photos of you <laughs> as the 10th Doctor reenacting some of those classic scenes. Yes. Reenact- you went to the beach. Yes, in Cardiff. Yeah, yeah the, the, for those who bad, haven't seen it, what am I talking about? Uh, it's Bad Wolf Bay. This bad is where Bay. he leaves Rose. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she gets into the other dimension. He, he leaves her behind. And it's also been the setting for just a number of episodes. The 11th Doctor had a, a, a bunch of the stone, Time of Stone and the Angels, I think. Mm. was filmed there. I mean, they keep going back to that beach repeatedly because it's just a, a very cool location, very barren location. Oh. Of course, I went on a day when it was bright and sunny and there were kids <laughs> running around and the waves <laughs> and splashing. And all those photos you see were very carefully cropped so that you didn't see everybody cooking, you know, barbecue <laughs> out on the, on the sand. Okay, so it's not as desolate of places as it seems in the show. Not on the nice days. Usually, <laughs> usually they're there when it's all cloudy and, and kind of like cold. And, you know. well, who took those photos? Um, that is a good friend of mine, Steve Ricks, uh-huh. who is a uh, fellow... You go to uh, makingmytenantcoat.com, yeah. your blogspot uh, webpage. If you make, make to making my tenant coat, type that into Google. He has blogs about making all the doctor's costumes. He's an amazing tailor. He's done a lot of work into researching and replicating the fabrics that go into making the doctor's outfits. And I was there visiting him, and we did video interviews with Louise Page, who was the costume designer oh, on wow. the first four or five seasons of the show. And so those are on his blog, and... You can see those and, and kind of get a kick out of those. But, yeah, he, he and I went, and he toured me around London and, and Cardiff, and we took those photos, and it was a lot of fun. You are a marvel. You get hip deep in any <laughs> fandom that you enjoy. Like, you just get, like, I'm, I won't be surprised if I see you somehow involved in the new He-Man line of the future, making videos or creating new character designs or something. Oh, that is you. super cool. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, okay, well, so follow him on uh, DeviantArt, and that's mm-hmm. alternatecoppa.deviantart.com. We will link to it in the mm-hmm. show notes. 
Uh, this show will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG93. Thank you once again to Kevin Copa. Thank you so much. Thank you to Matt and Eric in the control room and the, the Ann Arbor District Library for letting me put on this show every couple weeks. We'll be back in two weeks. We're going to talk with a couple filmmakers about uh, what we learn, what cartoonists can learn from film and not just trying to make comics that feel like movies. Uh, until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. Whenever we do this.